right, good morning, Southlands. If you can make your way into the studio, we will begin worshiping in just a few moments. Grab your coffee, check your child in, and make your way into the studio.
Southlands. Welcome to all those that are visiting us. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. We step into week two of Advent. The church around the globe celebrates the Advent season, which is the coming, the arriving of Christ. Isaiah chapter nine says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father prince of peace and week two of advent is peace when the angels appeared to the shepherds they ended their message by saying glory to god in the highest and peace among all those whom is pleased and i don't know about you but um i sure could use a bit of peace in this season how about you War, sickness, depression, anxiety seem to run rampant in our culture and in many of our lives. And even just the busyness of this holiday season could rob and still our peace. But the beauty is, is the Prince of Peace came. He stepped into our chaos, into our world to give us peace. He is a source of peace. He is a Prince of Peace. And so as we enter into this next song, uh, I want to invite you to long, to grab hold of, to look to the source of peace. Let's worship Southlands, the Prince of Peace.
hearts of kings and even as a baby you were changing everything you called me to your kingdom before your lips could speak and even as a baby you were reaching out for me and now we are awaiting the day of your return when every eye will see you as heaven comes to earth until the sky is open until the trumpet sounds the bride is getting ready the church is singing
of us, you know, we're in this room again. Maybe you've been in here dozens of times, hundreds of times, maybe just a few times. Maybe this is your first time here and there's a lot going on. There's a room full of people and this band and the lights and all this stuff. And I just feel like we need to just take one minute. realize that we stand on holy ground the holiness of the father doesn't change hasn't changed since the time of exodus where Moses knowing he was on holy ground took off his sandals and heard the voice of God himself saying, you need to stand back. Do not come near. For the ground on which you are standing is holy. 
We worship the same God today, friends. But because of Jesus, because of his birth, his crucifixion, because of his resurrection, we skip forward to Hebrews and a different invitation. Same God, different invitation. He says, boldly approach. Boldly approach with confidence. The throne of grace. So Lord, we approach you today, boldly. With nothing to claim other than the blood of Jesus. That is the entrance fee today. But friends, let's use the ticket that Jesus paid for this morning. Take the ticket out, wave it high, and boldly approach the throne with confidence. Because it's bought and paid for in full by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Are we, are we awake today, church? Are we alive? It's been bought and paid for fully. The debt is paid. So we boldly approach. We say, Lord, I have a claim today. Jesus, I have a claim. I can boldly approach the throne room of grace because I have a claim and it's the blood of Jesus. Amen. You have no rival. You have no equal. Let's enter in. Let's worship Him today. Push past distraction. Boldly approach. Yours is the kingdom. Yours Yours is is the glory. glory. Yours is the name. Morning, Southlands. Uh, my name is Alan, one of the pastors here. Isn't the presence of God breathtaking? We so appreciated Sam's prayer. So often we're a little bit like beggars on a beach of gold. We have the gold of the presence of God. But we need to appropriate it by faith. So well done just by drawing near in faith. God is not done. You know, this has been a year, by the way, this is Emma, and uh, (laughs) this is her friend Natalie, (laughs) and uh, Emma is not as cold as the last guy last week who was shivering when he got, we've, we've heated it up, which is great, come on in, the water's fine. But it it has been a year of God's lavish grace to us in so many ways. And one of the most lavish expressions of His grace is just people week after week after week who have wanted to declare their allegiance to Jesus publicly. It's just wonderful. It's the dream. Um, Emma will be the 26th person we've baptized this fall. Isn't that wonderful? And... uh, 
And we've got more people lined up in the next uh, couple of weeks and months, even on Christmas Eve, someone wants to be baptized. This is wonderful. And uh, this is kind of an Advent season. We can get into religious ritual. I love actually the ritual of the season, but I want to tell you, Jesus is still saving people. And people are still declaring allegiance to Christ as Lord. And so that's what Emma's going to do. And uh, so I've spent some time just interviewing her. But uh, on a day when we're actually going to talk about the gospel and friendship, I just thought it would be wonderful, Emma, quickly to talk about Natalie, because you really wanted Natalie at your side. Just a few words of what Natalie has been to you as a friend. Oh, um, now is the first person I've been able to really openly speak about my faith with. Um, she's always there for me. She's always there to listen. She's the best listener in the world. Um, there's so many things I could say, but I, I'm up here partly because of her, and I'm just so grateful for her. It's ultimately Jesus who saves, but Jesus uses friends. And I, I'm, I'm making time for this because actually Jesus wants to use you as a friend, leading people to Christ. So won't you take your, your seat in there? And I'm going to ask you two questions. And then, Natalie, you and I are going to, going to, here we go. Just grab our hands here in the middle. Great. Emma, do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. With the help of the Holy Spirit, do you commit to follow Him all the days of your life? I do. Well, on the confession of your faith, Natalie and I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well done. Please feel free, even if you sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit, to do that today. Uh, Kirk, one of our pastors, is there. We're happy to do that at the end of the service. If I can just ask for Natalie's family and friends, uh, those who know her, just to gather around. We're going to move on, uh, but let's pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen her to walk out her commitment to follow Jesus all the days of her life. This is just wonderful. Fantastic that she's got so many friends and family. Welcome, welcome. All right, won't you greet someone that you haven't already greeted, and we're going to move on in a few minutes. Good morning, good morning, Southlands. Please take your seats. We're so happy you're here. My name is Shannon. I'm the kids ministry director, but every once in a while I get to share about what's happening here at Southlands. 
Uh, so if it's your first time with us or you're visiting, we're so happy to have you. I've been a part of this church for a really long time, and I love it here. So I hope that your experience is as rich as mine has been. Um, if you are new, we would love to get a chance to say hello and get to know you a bit at our visitor center just outside these double doors um, for you to meet somebody and learn a bit about what it means to be a part of Southlands. Uh, we'd also like for you to stick six. So we want you to attend six times. That gives us a chance uh, to hopefully get to know you. It gets uh, an opportunity for you to get to know us, hear from different preachers, hopefully attend a community event, and just get a better idea of what it means to be a part of Southlands. Um, and I'll invite our ushers to take up tithe and offering. Uh, we, every week in kids ministry, take up offering with our kids, and this year we've raised over $400, which is a lot of money when it's crumpled up dollar bills and Legos and random stuff that we find in there every week. Um, but we talk about that uh, everything we've been given is from God, and so we're just putting things into his hands to be used uh, for us to be a blessing, and that all the money that we gather up makes sure that anyone who walks through our doors or we encounter in the city or globally gets to hear about the love of God. So thank you for your continued generosity, and uh, that's what your money's doing, is making sure people know that Jesus loves them. All right, coming up on December 15th, we have our Young Adults Night. So if you are 18 to into your 30s, you are invited. You're a young adult. Uh, students, we know that it's a tough time of year with finals, but we want you to take a break and enjoy an evening with us. On the 15th from 6 to 8.30 here at the church in the room next door to hear the chapel, um, we'll have a home-cooked meal, we'll have some fun, some worship, some games, as well as the teaching together. So there's a lot of joy happening outside, but we want to make sure that you have joy happening inside your hearts. So please join us. Married, students, if you've got kids, whatever, as long as you're in the, the 18 to 30-somethings, you're invited. Next week we have Spirit Sunday, so that's a chance for all of us to look a little bit ridiculous together on a Sunday. Um, so wear a sweater, wear any sort of decoration. Kevin might decorate his beard again this year. Um, if you've got kids, they can wear Christmas pajamas. If you want to wear your Christmas pajamas, you're welcome to. Um, but there will be prizes for best dress, most festive, things like that. So join us next week. It will be fun. All right, this one's a really important announcement to me, so pay close attention. Uh, we are partnering with Brea Churches to put on what's called Night to Shine. Uh, this is through the Tim Tebow Foundation, where we are going to be putting on a, uh, <laughs> yeah, should I kneel and pray? Um, we're going to be putting on a prom for teens and young adults with special needs, and it takes hundreds of volunteers to put this on. There's paparazzi, there's a red carpet, there's hair and makeup, there's people on the dance floor making sure the party gets going, as well as a respite room for parents where we get to uh, provide a meal, pray with them, just be a blessing. So please scan the QR, mark your calendar. It's February 9th. This is happening, happening globally. So we're partnering with churches all across the world and in our city to put on this event. I'm so excited. If you don't know what Night to Shine is, search on YouTube, and there's a bunch of promotional videos. It is going to be like a, an incredible blast. So please come. If you know someone who would be interested in attending, um, email us at access.ministry at southlands.net or come and find me, and we'll make sure they get an invitation. Um, but it's, we need a lot of help. There's a training meeting. There's a couple that you can choose from, but to serve, you need to be trained just so we're making sure we're um, caring for and protecting our guests appropriately. Um, so please go to that QR code where there's a form, there's information, things like that, but you're not going to want to miss it. All right. This was our great Southlands Bake Off today. And I've been told by our judges that this was an incredibly difficult competition. So if you provided a bake this week, this was a tough one to judge, I'm told. I haven't tried any. I'm waiting till after service. So everyone did an incredible job, but not everyone can win. That's not the vibe here. We like some competition. So <laughs> it's, it's only a, a little bit more fun that way. All right. If we can have a drum roll, please. For third place, we have Naomi Stokes. Naomi, come on up. 
Awesome. Thank you, Naomi. It's a very prized trophy for you. Be blessed by that. Thank you. Second place, we've got Tracy Weldon. Tracy, come on up. Awesome job, Tracy. It was tough, yeah. Okay, now, our first place winner. I need a big drum roll, please. The wonderful, the amazing, Wendy Helmuth. Yeah, Wendy! <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, if you guys are good listeners through service and you're on your best behavior, you can all have a cookie after we're done here. So, right outside these double doors, everyone will get a chance to try one of our cookies. And like I said, I've heard this is probably one of our best groups to date. All right, with that, I will welcome up Alan Frow. Thanks, Shannon. Good morning, everyone. Even though it's Orange County, not everyone gets a trophy. <laughs> but everyone does get a cookie. So that's good stuff. Before I call up my friend to, uh, to read our second Advent scripture. just wanted to give you a quick feedback on something I spoke to you about last week, which is our Good to Grow end of year campaign. And uh, I, I, I first just started off by thanking you because it's been a year of God's provision and generosity. We've called everyone to grow in the grace of giving. And praise God, this last year we've had 250 brand new givers in this church. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Give yourselves a hand if you were, were one of those. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, and because we've experienced God's provision in the area of just ongoing ministry, we're on track. Don't give up on, on your generosity. Thank you so much. Let's finish strong. But we've really felt uh, the need to steward this great building. The church is not a building. It's people. But this is a conduit um, of the gospel. And so I got... Uh, a slide up there to show you what we have already budgeted for and what we've already started doing. So what we have spent and, and saved, we've done the parking lot lights and parking lot resurface. We start the exterior paint tomorrow. No guesses for what the color is going to be. We don't know yet either. Uh, we have done the air conditioner. Uh, we are waiting for permits for our playground, but we have that money set aside for it. We are planning to redo the roof um, in the next three months. So that's fantastic. 300 grand total that we have stewarded, and that's happening. Praise God for that, right? Yeah. And uh, what we were, what was unforeseen that we weren't really able to prepare for was the growth that God has given us this year. We've grown by about 20%. And so we has, have, have felt the need just to uh, welcome practically more people as God grows our church. And so this column is what we still need. And for the overflow room, we need 15K for uh, the lobby sound and AV, bigger TVs and better sound. We are redoing the doors. The doors are 13 years old. They are creaking. Uh, patio furniture and lobby furniture. And then a studio remodel where we're going to actually get some space, get rid of those ledges and buy a couple hundred more chairs so that we don't need to yet go to third services. And so 120000 is what we're asking. We've already had $12,500 come in. Praise God for that. And so just want to ask that you would uh, go to the Lord. We don't want to twist your arm. But we want to call you into gospel partnership uh, in the midst of a season where we are perhaps going, man, that vacation, that gift, etc. God is generous enough to be able to look after our needs and also for us to sow into gospel ministry. Amen. So thank you for growing in the grace of giving. If you would like to give, there's the QR code. Hold it up. It'll go straight to the website and there will be a drop box for good to grow. All right. I can't remember who, who was. It was Hannah the first. Uh, it's Heather. Heather. Hannah and Heather. The two H's. Where are you, Heather? Let's give it up for Heather. She's going to read our Advent message. Heather is an outstanding staff member at Biola. 
She has been a long-term servant leader. She's a deaconess in our youth, in our greeters. She's just absolutely outstanding. So welcome. Welcome to you. Uh, here's the reading for this morning. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nishan, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Down to verse 16. And Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. much. Dave Covarubias, welcome from out of town. If I get a little emotional preaching, it's because my sister is here <coughs> with her husband, Pete. This is the first visit they've made in 16 years being here. It's wonderful. Um, my sister's middle name is Ruth, and I am serendipitously going to talk about Ruth from the genealogy of Jesus. And as uh, Joel so wonderfully preached last week, often we skip over the genealogies and get right to the story of the birth of Jesus because it's boring and the names like Aminadab are long. And I think often we just see no value in it. But actually there's great value in learning about your family tree. If you are wanting to breed a dog, you get really interested in the pedigree of its family tree and the other dog. If you are not wanting to get sick in the way that perhaps fathers and grandfathers got sick, you get really interested in family medical history. If you hear of a family member who died, who doesn't have a will, and you're like, I'm actually connected. You can get really interested in genealogies. And I think if we skip over the genealogies and go straight to the birth of Jesus, we miss out on the rich inheritance of understanding the significance of Jesus' family tree. And what can happen is that the, the birth narrative can become kind of cute and cozy, drinking peppermint hot chocolate around a cozy fire and I mean I love that stuff but the reality is that Jesus genealogy his family tree was not cute and cozy at all the family tree was gnarly it had some really suspect characters and the significance of this family tree is that we tend to want to edit out the suspect characters because we're, we're worried about guilt by association. But that's the whole point that Jesus was not ashamed of his family because, I mean, if you asked Jesus, tell me about your family tree, he would say something like, it's complicated. It's real complicated. And the significance of that is that he came to win a family that was also complicated like you and me. If you think of your family tree and the member that you would rather disown for fear of guilt by association, each of us can think of that crazy uncle. 
we've got a crazy uncle who disappeared. He's passed away now. He was communist. And he went to North Korea and popped up five years later as the speechwriter for Kim Il-sung. He worked for him for 10 years before he came back to Africa. And I can see already some of you are judging me. <laughs> like, ah, I knew there was something suspect about that guy. That's the whole reason I'd rather disown because there's guilt by association, suspect character, rather edit out. The beauty of the genealogy is Jesus doesn't edit, edit out any of the suspect characters. And in his family tree is Ruth, an immigrant. In his family tree is David, a murdering, adulterous king. In his family tree is Tamar, a victim of se sexual assault. We heard last week in his family tree is Rahab, the prostitute, and two women who fell pregnant out of wedlock. And Jesus is saying, the family that I came from is a hint of the family that I came for. That's the beauty of the genealogy. And we're going to look at, at Ruth. It comes just after the book of Judges. And uh, Ruth was a Moabite. Moab was a nation next to Israel. And we find in this genealogy that, that Ruth is the great, 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 great grandmother of David the king. David the king. And therefore, she's the great, 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 great grandmother of eventually Jesus. Why is she included in this family tree, this gnarly family tree? What's the significance of it? And we're going to find that, that Ruth was married into an Israelite family. Her mother-in-law was called Naomi. Naomi and her two sons and husband fled from Bethlehem in Israel to Moab because there was a famine. Bethlehem means the house of bread. There was no bread in the house of bread, so they fled, that rhymes, to Moab. <laughs> Better than I thought. And there they lived for a time, but instead of receiving fullness, they actually experienced death. And Naomi's husband died as well as her two sons. Leaving, it's a tragic story. Leaving Naomi with two daughters-in-law, all of them widows. So really, really tough. So they were destitute. They were widowed. They had no hope of a family line. And so we're going to pick up in Ruth chapter 1, verse 8 to 21. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return to you with your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until you were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God, where you die, I will die, and there I will be mar married, buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. And the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity 
upon me. The tragic story of, of loss, of grief, of two daughters-in-law who lift up their voices and weeping, we'll go with you, and then one doesn't, and returns to Moab, returns to her family, returns to her God, but Ruth is undeterred. She clings to her mother-in-law, and they return to Bethlehem in Israel. So we see, firstly, the bitterness of Naomi. I love the writing in this amazing story because there's a very ironic play on words. The word Naomi means sweet, and she returns to Bethlehem, after many years, they hardly notice her, recognize her. They say, is this Naomi? She says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me sweet. Call me Mara, and Mara means bitter. Don't call me sweet. Call me bitter, for the Lord has brought calamity upon me. I went away full, but came back empty. She is in grief. She is in bitterness of soul. She's in a crisis of faith. There's a bitterness in her. But let's give her grace and credit. She's lost her husband and her two sons. She's come back with nothing except a daughter-in-law. And in the midst of it, she's actually big-hearted enough to say to her daughters-in-law, you stay in Moab. Just just stay in Moab. It's going to be much better for you. So there is actually a graciousness of heart in the midst of her grief, but she is bitter. Don't call me sweet. Call me Bitter. How's your year been? Bittersweet, many people say. How's your year? It's been bittersweet. A little bit of bitter, a little bit of sweet. Some of you say a little bit more sweet than bitter. Others much more bitter than sweet. We have years like that. I don't think anyone's probably had a year where you're like, it's been so bitter, change my name to Mara. Maybe some of you have. And if you are sitting there, I would rather be called Mara than my name. This is for you. And so we see the bitterness of Naomi, but then we see the the courage of Ruth. They both lift up their voices in weeping. We'll go with you, but Orpah doesn't follow through. She overpromises and underdelivers. Ruth is determined. She clings to her mother-in-law for heaven's sake i mean these words of covenant are so so powerful that they've been used in marriage ceremonies before where you lodge i will lodge where you go i will go where you stay i will stay your people will be my people your god will be my god may may god kill me if i do not be faithful to this i mean it's 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 like marriage but this is to your mother-in-law i'm sure you love your mother-in-law i don't think you'd say that to your mother-in-law anyone? I love my mother-in-law. I wouldn't say that to her. So there's an incredible courage. It's actually an amazing thing if you think of the word Ruth, and this is why I call it the Ruthfulness of Jesus. We get our word. I love words. I love etymology. I'm an English teacher by training, and the word Ruth is connected to the word ruthless, which means what? Help me? Help a brother out? Ruthless means, means lacking or in compassion, lacking in kindness. And that's, that's a common word. I mean, sometimes we use it in a complimentary way on the sports field. Ah, we're just ruthless. But mostly it's an insult. That person is ruthless. Hundreds of years ago, there was another word, which was the opposite of ruthless, which was ruthful which literally meant full of kindness and full of compassion. Where do you think the word ruthful came from? Ruth the Moabite, widow. Her her life was so powerfully kind, so courageously compassionate, that there's a whole culture (laughs) that says the lack of that is ruthless. Isn't that amazing? Love the fact that biblical history shapes culture in that way. I think we should re-enter the word ruthful. How about it? I mean, that's a great compliment. You are ruthful. We need more ruthfulness in our ruthless day, don't we? And so she is ruthful. She's, she's amazing. And her, her compassion... So here's the thing. How, how many of you have ever been... Have, have any, ever been immigrants? Have ever migrated to another country? How many of you? 
immigration always requires courage. It always requires sacrifice. It always requires leaving what you know, even if what you know is tough. You know why you do it? You do it in the hope of a better life. She had no hope of a better life. I mean, she was going to be an immigrant in Israel and international relations between Israel and Moab were not that great. So she was leaving security. She didn't have a future in the sense that even Naomi said, there's no future for you. It's not going to be good for you. And yet she goes, what is it? There's kindness and there's compassion at the heart of her courage. And so she returns and it is harvesting season. And Naomi tells her to go and glean from a harvester, a farmer called Boaz. Now he has a little thing for free that I think just shows the brilliance of God in finances. God had a law for farmers that they were to sow and plant in squares, but to reap in circles. They weren't allowed to reap all that they sowed. They were to leave the corners of the, of the field for immigrants. Isn't that beautiful? God's heart for the poor. God's heart for the immigrant. You are not, he, God is basically saying, I, I will take care of you. Now be generous to those without and allow them to glean in the corners. Beautiful. This is a, a principle for us always to trust God enough to give. Don't reap in squares, reap in circles. And so she's gleaning in the corners of the field, this man called Boaz. And she discovers that Boaz is actually family of Naomi. He is what they call a kinsman redeemer. Now, now, now a kinsman redeemer was someone who, they weren't forced to do this, but they had the option of buying the land of a widow and restoring finance to her and also marrying her offspring so that her line could carry on. And I want to tell you, Boaz did that. And what happened was, he didn't make the proposal. Ruth did. This widow, this immigrant, she is so, uh, you know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, you know, the, the Bible is just so patriarchal and it just makes women like doormats. Not Ruth. She is undeterred. She makes a proposal to this farmer, this landowner, and says, be my kinsman redeemer. And he does. And I want to say that was deeply sacrificial. Because if he did have the Tinder app, swipe right, swipe right, he wouldn't have stopped at a widow and he wouldn't have stopped at a Moabite. He would have said, let me have an Israelite and let me have someone unmarried. There was something of a compassion and kindness that moved him. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful story of loss and God redeeming through kindness. And so we pick up in Ruth chapter 4, Verse 13 to 17, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons. Can we just stop there for a moment? Oh, you know, the Bible only values men, doesn't value women. No, Ruth was more worth more than seven sons. It's beautiful. Has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Who would have thunk? Little Ruth immigrant, widow, is now the great, 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 great grandmother of royalty, of King David. It's amazing how God turns social orders on their head. God shows us that actually I'm able to exalt the humble. I'm able to do mighty things with those who are compassionate and courageous. And we see this courageous kindness, this ruthfulness at work, both in Naomi and in Boaz and in Ruth. 
This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But I want to tell you, this is not just a nice story. This has vital, vital insight into the story of Jesus and into His incarnation, His coming. And I want to just look at two big lessons we have from the story of Ruth that shine light on the story of Jesus' birth. You ready for them? Three of you are. How about the other 450? You ready for them? The first is the transforming power of friendship. Your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. The, the transforming power of, of friendship. Ruth didn't have any legal obligation to go. And yet she did. Naomi didn't have any legal claim on Ruth. She actually said, go back. Each of them sought the good of the other. There's this transforming power of sacrificial friendship. And what I think is absolutely amazing is this. There is a conversion moment here. She comes from foreign gods in Moab. And yet she says, your God will be my God. She converts to Yahweh. Very often our culture is like against proselytization and it's like don't force people to convert. There's no forcing her to convert. In fact, Naomi is in the crisis of faith of her life. She is not being a good evangelist. She is describing Yahweh as the Lord's hand has brought calamity on you. And Ruth turns around and says, I'll have that God. I want your God. I was like, what? on earth is going on here that she converts. I'll tell you what is going on. Naomi came from Yahweh and even though she's in a crisis of faith, she is walking out Yahweh's sacrificial love towards Ruth. And Ruth is able to compare her sacrificial love with the child sacrificing hatred of Moabite gods. And she's saying, I want your God. Even though you're in the middle of darkness and mystery and, and loss and, and, and you feel like God's hand is against, I want your God. And beloved, we need to realize that it's God who saves, but he so often does it through the ordinary means of sacrificial friendship. You think of Boaz. How did little Ruth get into Jesus' family? Through Boaz saying, I'm not going to take an Israelite. He had no, no need to marry a Moabite, but he did. It was kindness. He sought her good. And you know, Ruth gives us a, a great little coaching manual on what a good friend is. A good friend gives both commitment and time. Your people will be my people and your abode will be my abode. I, I commit to you and I will spend time with you. If you want to be a good friend, you've got to commit and you've got to give time. And it's not enough to say, you're my BFF. I really love you. So often in our friendships, we overpromise and underdeliver. When I grew up, guys never said, I love you, bro. That came in around 2009, <laughs> when guys started to say, I love you, bro. And I actually love the fact that we can say, I love you, bro. And I can say to like a sister, I love you. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But too often, we easy with those words. And we don't actually walk them out sacrificially. And what we see is the contrast between Ruth's love and Orpah's love. Both of them lifted up their voices saying, Naomi, we love you, we'll never leave you. And Orpah went, she overpromised and underdelivered. But actually, Ruth clung to her. She, she was faithful. And I want to say, where are we talking about the transforming power of friendship? It was actually Ruth's friendship that transformed Naomi and Naomi's friendship that transformed. It wasn't what they said, it's what, what they did. 
And over years of, I'm rich with friends. Some friendships have got strained over time, but some friendships are 30 years long. And I, I, man, I have found that often people that make declarations of love and commitment are not necessarily people that follow through. And some people that really under promise friendship, they really over deliver. We've got these friends, Brian and Rachel, who planted into Houston from this church. And, and Rachel is one of them. She is faithful, but she's very effusive. And she always saying, I love you, I love you. It's awesome. Brian is like a Viking. He, he doesn't say that stuff. And I think Rachel wishes he would. A few years ago, we were doing a conference in the UK. We're staying in an Airbnb together. And we're looking out at the sun going down on the ocean in Bournemouth. And there's just this beautiful moment. And Brian, this like stoic Viking, he says, he looks at the three of us and says, I love yous. I love yous. And Rachel's just like, you said it. You said it. It's so amazing. You said I love you. He was like, no, I said I love views. I love views. Not I love you. I love views. I'm loving the view. I was just like, man, come on. Express yourself, buddy. Express yourself, buddy. But, but you know, there are those people that don't express it so much, but they actually live it out. And this little teaching on friendship is, is about someone who she did declare, but man, she lived it out. And it resulted in massive transformation. Boaz lived it out, massive transformation. I want you to think about your friendships. Do an audit on, on your friendships and think about how God has used people to change you. And it's through faithfulness. You heard Emma talk about the faithfulness of Natalie. She stuck with me. She's held me accountable. She's been gracious. I believe in a, in a pandemic of loneliness that faithful, sacrificial friendship is like, it's, it's the gateway drug to Jesus, the friend of all sinners. You think about the friends who, who made a hole in the roof, let the paralytic down. Friends, We'll dig a hole in the roof. They're like, man, no, 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 we're going to get you to Jesus. It's okay, we're going to get you to Jesus. We'll, we'll, we'll dig some holes in roofs, but we'll get you there. Friendships are, are undeterred. They, they're often unspectacular. And I think often we, we say, Lord, use me powerfully to bring people to Jesus. Start by being a good friend. Don't underestimate the power of friendship. My wife is like a quiet assassin when it comes to evangelism, but it's through friendship. And I've watched her over decades her family members, bridesmaids, just bit by bit come to Jesus. She's better than me at that. And why, why am I belaboring this point? Because Jesus in his incarnation called himself, he was called the friend of sinners. And think about the inefficiency of his ministry. He comes, if I was Jesus, I was like, okay, let's have a strategic evangelism campaign. Time is short. But he spends 30 years Navigating relational complexity in a family that didn't get that he was the Messiah with a half dad learning a trade from him in a carpenter shop. Super frustrating. Then when he eventually does launch his ministry, miracles, he wastes all this time with prostitutes and tax collectors being their friend. What a waste of time. And the Pharisees, religious people, insulted me. You're a friend of prostitutes and, and, and tax collectors. He wore it like a badge of honor. Why? Essentially, he was saying, if you understand the complicated family I come from, that's a hint at the complicated family I'm coming for. And he wasted all this time with these disciples who would betray him and deny him. Think about the fact that Judas didn't send him a lawyer's letter, but kissed him in betrayal. That is intimacy. That's friendship. Jesus knew it would happen. Didn't hold him at arm's length. Kissed him in betrayal. John rested his chest, his head, head on his chest. And Peter would deny him. And yet he says in John 15, greater love has no man than that he lay down his life for his friends. Friendship, the, the, the transforming power of sacrificial friendship 
we see it in Ruth, we see it in Jesus' life. And it tells us this, that God is not just on a mission to save you from hell. He is. But He is on a mission to know, be known by you and to know you. Didn't just call Himself a rescuer, He is. He called Himself a friend. Jesus laid down His life to make enemies into friends of God. Now, this is the opportunity to say, man, this God doesn't just forgive me my sins. He wants to know me. He wants to walk with me. That old hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and cares to bear. What a privilege to carry all our cares to God in prayer. Jesus is an incredible friend. Waste time with him. This Christmas, carve out time to waste time with Jesus. It's never a waste of time. This Christmas, audit your friendships. You go, what kind of friend have I been? Have I been a friend that's overpromised like Orpa and then left? Or have I been a friend like Ruth that's clung through hardship? God wants friendship with us, and His friendship transforms us. I am so grateful for the patient friendship of Jesus with me. How about you? Man, I don't know, man. I wouldn't have the patience he's had for me. Aren't you? So patient. Every morning you wake up, it's like there he's there, giving us a second chance and a third chance, fourth chance. So patient, so gracious. There's no other God like that. No other God like that. Transforming power of friendship. Secondly and lastly, what I would call the hiddenness of hope. What do we learn from Ruth? The hiddenness of hope. And that connects to, to, to the incarnation. Here's what fascinates me most about this story. Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. And they say, is this Naomi? Is this sweet? She says, no, it's Mara. It's bitter. Because I went away full and I came back empty. What a, like a declaration. I went away full and I came back empty. The Lord's hand has brought calamity on If I was Ruth, I would just be, I'm clinging to her, right? And I've said, I will go where you go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be, I mean, I've left my household gods to embrace your God. But no, I'm, I'm empty. And I would just be saying, little Ruth, what am I? Chopped liver. Like, do I not factor I mean, I know you've suffered grief and, and loss, but do I not factor as something that at least fills the pantry a little bit? Just a little bit. But no. Bitterness has blinded Naomi to the goodness of God in Ruth. Why? Because it's so hidden. It's so ordinary. It's so normal. And I think Naomi, like most of us, was expecting some like massive big, cows and hay bales to drop from heaven. Then God has replenished me. Expecting something spectacular. But God didn't give her something spectacular. He gave her Ruth. And what she was blind to was that through Ruth, God was joining Naomi and Ruth into Jesus' line. She was blind. Why? Because there's hiddenness often in God's work. We can't see it. Even in friendship, I, I, I've thought about the faithful friends that God has given me, and I am thankful for them, but very often my prayer life will be something like, God, why not you come through for me? I'm trusting you to come through for me. And then Kevin will call and say, how are you doing, Frau? I was like, I'm doing good. Thanks, Kev. God, won't you come through to me? And then Kirk uh, was like, hey man, I'm praying for you. Can I come and help you? No, I'm good. God, won't you come through to me? stupid because we, we, we're always expecting something spectacular but actually very often God's hand is hidden in ordinary means through friends and counselors and pastors and someone who says I'm praying for you and thrive mentors and we don't see it as God but it's God and I'm praying that our eyes would be opened in this time of course we trust in God for spectacular things but even in the story of Jesus' birth, you get the angels 
The choir of angels appearing to the shepherds. Fantastic! The shepherds got an angel, a choir of angels. But everyone else, they got a stinky old shepherd. They had to listen to a shepherd proclaim the good news about Jesus. And I think if you like me, it's like, I want a choir of angels, God. I want you to ride it on the sky. And if you don't, I won't believe. Well, will you listen to a stinky old shepherd? Because sometimes that's all you get. Sorry. Can, can God reveal himself to you through a stinky old shepherd? Or do you need a celebrity pastor? Do you need a famous podcaster? Or can God reveal himself to you through the ordinary means of friends and community groups and mentors and someone who says, I'm praying for you and I mean it. I'm not just sending a little th thought, blessed thought up to the big guy upstairs. Those things are the, the hiddenness of hope. We sing that carol, my favorite carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Veiled in Flesh, the Godhead See. Hail the incarnate deity. The God-man was veiled, hidden in flesh. You think how few thrones there were in that region at that time. You think how many mangers there were at that time. And which did God come to? A throne or a manger? You tell me. A manger. The Son of God, Savior of the world, born to be king, was lying, bloodied, crying in a straw manger. And the question of the gospel is, will you recognize him? Will you recognize the hiddenness of God coming, veiled in human form, majesty hidden, not on a throne, not on a war horse, but in a stable and on a donkey and on a cross. Oh God, open our eyes to the hiddenness of hope. There's that old hymn, and I'll land with this, by a hymn writer called William Cowper, called God Moves in Mysterious Ways. Any of you remember that, that old hymn? Any Presbyterians in the room? Baptists, come on. And William Cowper, who actually suffered from depression all of his life, but he would break through in moments of inspiration. And he wrote this great hymn about God moving in mysterious ways. And he says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, there hides a smiling face. See, Naomi had a frowning providence. She, it felt like God was frowning. But behind the frowning providence, there was a smiling face. God was smiling. God was like, Naomi, you haven't seen anything yet. It's the same as God sending Jesus. Wrapped in flesh, wrapped in swaddling clothes. It, it just looked like a frowning. I mean, the Israelites are like, what is this? We expected a military king, a political leader. What is this? What can this do? No, behind a frowning providence, there hides a smiling face. So let's not trust our feeble sense to say, well, God's hand is against me. No, God's hand is for you. And this is how we know God's hand is for us, even in loss, even in grief, even in bitterness. We know this, that God has not forsaken us, God's hand is for us because the only person God's hand was actually for in this story was his own son, Jesus. God's hand was against Jesus on the cross. He put our sin, put our judgment on him so that his hand would always be for us. Because Christ absorbed the calamity of the cross, we receive the blessing of the cross. That's great news. And it's not just that we were saved from hell. Salvation is that. But it's not just fire insurance. It's friendship with the friend of sinners who laid his life down to make enemies friends. Amen? Let's trust him. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> the genealogy teaches us that 
that, that the gospel is good news. It's not good advice. It's not like do this and do this and do this and then you'll be welcomed into God's family. Come on, look at this jacked up family. And Jesus is saying, the jacked up family that I came from is the jacked up family that I'm coming for by grace. And you receive it by grace. It's good news, not good advice. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful that you came from this very complicated family and included little Ruth and Naomi in it to show us that there is no life that is insignificant. No friendship that is insignificant. And, and Lord, no one that is without hope. And we ask, Lord, that, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we might see your work in our lives, even if it is hidden, that we would trust you. We would trust you. And thank you, Jesus, that you have laid down your life for us, your friends. We just say thank you. What a friend we have in Jesus. And before we go to the table and sing, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus' invitation to join his family. Say, man, join my complicated family. The only, only thing you need is need and faith that actually my death, laying down my life for my friends is enough. That's all you need. So I want to give you an opportunity just to respond right now before we sing and go to the table. If you're saying, I want the friendship of Jesus. I want Jesus to bind his life to mine and I'm giving my life to his. Why don't you just quickly put up your hand. I'd love to pray for you. Is there anyone here? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Jesus. I wonder if we could just together pray along with these people who are responding to Jesus just after me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you laid down your life for me. I respond with faith. Please forgive me. Please adopt me. I receive that by faith. Thank you that I can't earn it but I receive it with joy. Lord Jesus, help me to be a better friend that more people would come to know you. Let's stand together. Thank you, Al. The story of Ruth and Boaz is a picture of how Jesus redeems us. Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer who voluntarily paid the price for our debt and took us as his bride. Isn't that good news? No greater love than this than one that would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus calls you a friend. And if that wasn't enough, which it is in itself, he then collectively created a community, a people, friends, under his headship, he grafted us into his family tree. And in 1 Corinthians, we see that Jesus sat with his friends, this new community. And he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. He took a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And so we're gonna do the same as a family, as friends, as a community, we're gonna grab the elements, communion elements, and we're going to just get in groups. Three to five, it could be friends or family, or it could just be somebody near you. Create new ones. And we're just going to reflect upon, thank God for the beauty of friendship with Him and with one another. And then just simply ask God to reveal the hope around you. So let's do that now. Let's go to the communion tables. We have them in the corner and in the back of the room. And let's gather in groups.
born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our resting place Israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art desire of every nation joy of every
Southlands, it's so great sitting under the preached word and worshiping with you this morning. If you're just struggling with the idea of friendship, just feeling disconnected within community, I would love to meet you and help you get connected this morning. I'll be right down up here in front. If you're struggling to see hope as well, we have a prayer team off to my left and to my right. They would love to pray for you. Don't leave here without receiving prayer. I love you guys. It's so great to be part of this family and community. I'm so thankful for God's grace. Go in his peace and have a great Sunday.